Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 6 reads, Listen to me, you coastlands. Pay attention, you faraway peoples. The Lord called me from the womb. When I was inside my mother, He mentioned my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. He hid me in the shadow of His hand. He made me a polished arrow. He concealed me in His quiver. He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my glory. But I said to myself, I have labored in vain. I spent my strength and came up empty with nothing. Yet a just verdict for me rests with the Lord, and my reward is with my God. But now the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be a servant, to turn Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him, so that I will be honored in the eyes of the Lord, because my God has been my strength. The Lord said, it is too small a thing that you should just be my servant to raise up the holy tribes of Jacob and to restore the ones I have preserved in Israel. So, I will appoint you to be a light for the nations, so that my salvation will be known to the ends of the earth. Here ends the Old Testament reading. Turn our attention now to the second reading today, the epistle lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading verses 1 to 9. This is also our sermon text for today. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, who are called as saints, along with all in every place who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. You were enriched in Him in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because the testimony about Christ was established in you. As a result, you do not lack any gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also keep you strong until the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here ends our epistle lesson. A verse of the day taken from that Old Testament reading. Hallelujah! He said to me, You are my servant in whom I will display my splendor. Alleluia! Dear friends, we stand in respect to the Holy Gospel our Lord gives us today through the Gospel writer John reading in the first chapter, verses 29 to 41. Again, the highlight of this theme of the, the Sunday highlights the, uh, John the Baptist, who we heard last week, baptized Jesus, and now he's seen him a couple of times after this. And we note his declaration, his proclamation, the confession of who Christ is in that, that view, right? He's the Lamb of God, that Lamb who comes to take away the sins of the world. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I was talking about when I said, The one coming after me outranks me because he existed before me. I myself did not know who he was, but I came baptizing with water so that he would be revealed to Israel. John also testified, I saw the Spirit descend like a dove from heaven and remain on him. I myself did not recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, The one on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this myself, and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was standing there again with two of his disciples. When John saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned around and saw them following him, he asked, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He told them, Come and you will see. So they came and they saw where he was staying. They stayed with him that day. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his own brother Simon and say to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Here ends our Gospel 
reading. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, dear friends. As I mentioned, the word of our Lord upon which we want to base our meditation today is that epistle reading taken from Paul's opening verses of his first letter. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write to the church in Corinth. who was facing a lot of different challenges. There were divisions going on there, this idea of being allegiant to a certain leader within the church, some being upset about that and saying, I'm not following anybody, creating all sorts of different trials and challenges. So the Apostle Paul, who had been implemented in helping to find, found that church in his missionary journeys, now is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this epistle. And he starts off with this opening greeting. We might think, well, it's just a salutation. Greetings, brothers and sisters. It's my joy and privilege to write to you, but it's a lot more. These coming Sundays after Epiphany leading up to Transfiguration Sunday, we're going to have the chance to look at more and more of these verses of 1 Corinthians. So today we take a look at these first nine verses. We do so under that theme. An answer to life's three important questions. Now, here's the ultimate question. What are the three life important questions? What are defined as, what are the three most important questions someone asks? Now some might think, you know, it might be based on where you live in the world. Because there are places where one of the most important questions that everybody in that family, in that village, that tribe might have is, what are we going to eat today? That they truly are living day by day in that existence. But but even in a challenge like that, comes these three basic questions that really, little, not so little, older, do find themselves asking. First, who am I? Next, why am I here? Third, Where am I going? I I think that's all encompassing. Who we are. Who am I? And I'm not talking about what your DNA says. I'm not talking about your fingerprint. I don't care about your driver's license, your birth certificate. What? what, That's that's an identity, right? That's a, a title. That's a connection. Really, we talk about, you know, who am I? How do you answer that question? So we look at you and say, who are you? First thing right away, we might say, well, I'm going to give my name. Preschool chapel this week. Sang with the kids, I am Jesus, little lamb. And the last line of that verse verse says, he even calls me by my name. So who am I? Who am I? My, my name matters, but what matters is this marvel that, guess what? God knows us. He knows us because He has, as Paul reminds us, sanctified us. Right? He knows us by name and He put His name on us and He has sanctified us. He has set us apart. So when we ask that first important question, who am I? Those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, who are called as saints. Along with all in every place. Right? Paul's in, all inclusive here. He isn't just talking about those believers in Corinth that are hearing this letter. He, he highlights this is everybody. Everybody that God has put His name on, He has sanctified. And again, that, that understanding of what sanctification is. Right? It's one of those big doctrinal terms, right? Oh, it's important though. Because it does give us this recognition. It reminds us of who we are. Being sanctified means God has come and He has taken us and has set us apart. He has made us holy. He has made us holy. It's not that you and I have to work at this and, 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 and find our own identity. 
God in love comes and He sanctifies. He sets us apart. He makes us holy. So when it comes to that question, who am I? Here's our answer. I am a sanctified believer. Right? I'm a sanctified believer and I'm joined together with all believers. Right? That's our identity. Understand the power. Understand the importance of this. You belong. You have a place, right? And I know, I know in talking to some of you, there's a struggles at times, different stages in life. And one of the biggest doubts that Satan just loves to grind at people is, I'm all alone. I'm all by myself. I really feel lonely. And people could be saying that even with family all around them. Because they're, they're in this situation, they're in this struggle, and, and Satan's wanting to grab hold and try and convince them that no one else can understand your struggle, your pain, your hurt, your confusion, whatever you might be going through. And Satan wants, yeah, you're all alone, no one cares, and loves to drag people away in that despair. But behold God's incredible love and this reminder again today. Who am I? I'm a sanctified child of God. The Holy Spirit has called me. And He's made me His own. He cares about me. Jesus is my Savior. I have an identity and I'm not alone because I'm gathered together. I'm joined together with all other Christians throughout the whole world. Because Jesus came, yes, to save the children of Israel. But as the servant song of Isaiah reminds us, not just them, but everybody. That's too small. That was too small of a job, God the Father said through the prophet Isaiah. You're going to be a light for the whole world. You're going to be a light for all the Gentiles as well. And that's what's happened. Jesus has come to be our Savior. And in that, we have this identity. Who am I? Who are we? We're sanctified believers, bought by the blood of Jesus, joined in that family by God putting His name on us, Him coming to us and making us His own. We have an identity that cannot be taken away because God has put it on us. So we belong. And yes, friends, sometimes in the hardest times, the deepest times, the darkest times, And Satan wants to work on you. We need to be reminded of this, this call. You're not alone. You're God's child. You're part of God's family. He who loved you enough to send His one and only Son, you might be His. This is that assurance we have. So there's the who am I. Next important question, why am I here? Again, I think this is a question that people struggle at different stages in life. But we have the two spectrums. Kids might figure, why am I here? I'm not old enough to do anything. Mom and Dad won't let me drive the vehicle. Can't even go shopping on my own. I've got to be with them. Why am I even here? Why am I around, right? And then we have this busy time of life, and all of a sudden you get to the other spectrum. You say, God, why am I here? I'm can't do anything. I'm so frustrated. I'm so tired. I'm just can't do I'm I'm more of a burden to my family. I'm more of a burden to people than I am a help. Why am I here, God? And again, God in love comes to us today with this very important answer to this question through these powerful words of the apostle Paul. Paul reminds us starting at verse 5, right? You were enriched in him in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because the testimony about Christ was established in you. As a result, you do not lack any gift as you wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus. Why are we here? Because God's put us here and He's got a plan and a purpose. And it doesn't matter our age. It doesn't matter what station or role, vocation, responsibility you have in different stages in, in life in the world. You're here and you've been enriched by a loving God and you have been blessed with tremendous gifts. 
And Paul's reminding us, let's acknowledge those gifts and let's use those gifts. Let's use those gifts to serve God. He gives us a purpose every day. And age, strength, ability, power, that doesn't matter. Paul reminds us that God gives us gifts. He gives us opportunities and He gives us abilities and He wants you and I to be willing and ready to serve God, which then also means serving others, helping each other out. And you do have that purpose. I know some are thinking, yeah, I used to be at that stage of helping others out. Now I rely on them. But please understand and remember that too is a purpose. Think about that. I had a long visit with a gentleman, 93 years old. Towards the latter part of his wife's life, he spent every day at the nursing home with her because she had dementia. And he became a fixture there, and the nursing staff loved this man because he displayed that Christ-like love. He showed that Christian commitment to his wife, even though in the last year and a half, she didn't even recognize him, even though he was there every day with her. And he would stay every day with her and take care of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when she was sleeping, he'd walk around and he'd help out others. Well, then God in His kindness called her home to heaven. And now he was alone. Now he was a burden in his mind to his daughter, whose house he was, he was living at. So Bill and I had a long talk. And we talked about these words. That if God's given you this day, He's given you gifts and He's given you a purpose. And it can be even at that stage in that time that part of the purpose is you are giving, and, and I had to keep on assuring them this, he didn't believe it, but knowing the family, knowing his daughter and the other family that was nearby, there was incredible joy that finally after all these years, they could take care of him. And of course, he was one of these rough, tough cowboys. I mean, true cowboy, right? Rough, beaten up hat. Riding on a horse in the middle of winter, zero degree weather in Nebraska, taking care of the cattle, the feedlots. I mean, this guy was a rough and tough, true, true grit kind of cowboy guy. Right? He didn't want to be taken care of. He wanted to take care of everybody else. But at that stage, I reminded him, Bill, if God has clearly given you these days, which He is, He's giving you this opportunity to use your gifts, to be so thankful. Just as in the nursing home, day after day, you let your light of faith shine. Now also, today, even in your house with your, with your daughter, with your son-in-law, with the other grandkids that are around, you're letting your light of faith shine and you're giving them that gift and that encouragement. God's got a purpose for you. And when He finally says, I'm ready for you, He'll take you home. But until that day, you have a purpose. Friends, that's for every one of us. He gives us gifts, and He wants us to use those gifts to first and foremost serve God. Give Him that glory. Give Him that honor. Give Him that opportunity. And and recognize you have gifts. Even if that gift is you are here and giving yourself the opportunity for others to help. Because then that's how God makes us all work together. So don't let Satan convince you of a lie that you get so convinced and think, there's no reason why I'm here. Yes, if you're here today and God is giving you breath and your heart is beating, He's given you gifts, He's given you opportunities, and rejoice in that. Recognize that. Don't let Satan convince you otherwise. Again, from young to old, we have a purpose. We've been given these gifts. Let's use them. Let's use them as often and as regular as we can to give honor and glory to God and to serve and help each other out. That's why we're here. The last one? Where am I going? Where am I going? Where's this road, this path of life leading me to? You eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus. 
He will also keep you strong until the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Where are we going? Well, we know Judgment Day is coming. Right? The Bible tells us the signs of the end times. We're in the end times. The signs are all there. Wars, rumors of war, pestilence, famine, fires, floods. I mean, all the signs are there, but recognize they were there pretty much the day after Jesus ascended into heaven. Right? And, and, and that's there for a reason. We don't know the day. And, and whether it's Him individually calling us home or together, when Judgment Day comes, where are we going? By God's grace, by the redeeming work of Jesus, where are we going? We're going home to heaven. We have a purpose. We have a prize waiting for us at the end of this race called life. This, this journey, this adventure. It's heaven. It's the reward. And it's been earned by us by Jesus. There's no way we're going to lose this. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's going to take care of it. He's going to make sure it's there for us at the end. Where are we going? By God's grace and because of Jesus, we're going home to heaven. And yeah, there are days where we pray, Come, Lord Jesus, I'm ready now. Right? But remember, He's made it clear who you are. You're a sanctified believer. You have gifts. Use them. Use them every day until that day. He takes us all home to heaven on that judgment day if we're all alive walking in this day because we don't know when it's going to be or if He takes you home individually. Know that's where you're going. Know that's the goal. And know it's there, guaranteed. No one, not Satan, not this world, not even yourselves has the power, the ability to rip that away. That's God's guarantee, right? Nothing in this world has the power. Now, we can let it. We can say this is too much and want to run away at times. We've all been there. But God in His faithfulness remains. God in His faithfulness comes to us and says, Hey, you're mine. Hey, I've given you an identity. I love you. Look, I'm I'm giving you gifts. I'm giving you blessings. Recognize that. Serve Him. Serve others. There's our purpose, right? And then no, no, that yes, because of Jesus, heaven is my home. What a blessing. What a gift to know. God is there to answer these important questions of our lives every day. He's there because He truly loves us. May we honor Him and give Him that glory every day. Amen.